It's Cognitive Psychology, and this is our brief supplement on connectionist modeling to go along with our content on categories and category knowledge. Now, we've been talking about human knowledge structures quite a bit in class so far, but for this little module, we'll be thinking about whether there are simulations of human knowledge structures that we can make outside of ourselves. In a connectionist network, we have different information processing units known as nodes. Now, a node is simply that processing unit that occurs when two connections join. Those connections are sometimes known as links or edges in the network. Knowledge can be represented as a distributed activity throughout the network. So there might be many units active at the same time that together form a stable representation of something. Another property of a network like this is its parallel distributed processing. That means many units can be active in parallel at the same time. And the activation state can be distributed throughout the network with multiple processing units active simultaneously. Parallel distributed processing networks are also known as neural networks, which is another word for deep learning or uh, a phenomenon also known as AI or artificial intelligence. The other feature of these connectionist models is that the weights will determine how strongly an incoming signal is passed on to outgoing uh, connections. So we'll talk about each of these features in a little bit more detail as we go along. Throughout these slides, we will be representing incoming information as going into input nodes at the bottom and the outcomes of the processing system as that row of nodes at the top where we will see our output representation. In between the input layer and the output layer, we may have supplementary layers in between known as hidden layers. So we'll start by walking through a very simple network architecture with a one-to-one -one mapping between input nodes and output nodes. In a network such as this one, if we activate one node at the input, that activation can travel along the edge to the output and we might get uh, an activation on the other side. So you might like to imagine this as like a fairground activity and at one end you have like a giant keyboard or something and at the other end you have like a row of light bulbs and if you stand on one of the keys or you push one of the paddles at your end of the system, one of the light bulbs lights up at the other end of the system. Uh, in a system like this the outcomes are highly predictable, so if instead we push a different key on the input layer we get a different light bulb lighting up. And similarly, if we push multiple keys at the same time, we get multiple outputs lighting up. But again, we still have that one-to-one -one relationship between inputs and outputs in this system. So you can see that this is a somewhat limited processing system as there are only so many ways that we can represent information in a system like this. The way it goes in is the same as the way it comes out. A more complicated network architecture is one like this one with a one to many mapping. So this time around, when we activate one node in the input, we get representation across all of the nodes in the output. Now, obviously, if we push any key, we get all of the light bulbs lighting up in this scenario. So this is a very limited uh, set of options for us unless we can do something to change the amount of activation that goes to each of those different light bulbs. So if we adjust the weights in the network, if we adjust the amount of connectivity that can pass from each node in the input layer to each node in the output layer, then we can end up with a more subtle system. So now when we activate one node in the input layer, we might be able to represent that input with two nodes in the output layer. And this allows a much more flexible way of uh, transforming information from an input to an output. The other option that we have though with these weights is that we don't have to set them to just on or off. So now we have a much more dynamic system for transforming information from inputs to outputs so that the outputs are different from the inputs that we uh, put into the system before processing. We can make this system much more complicated though. If we add another layer, we can call this a hidden layer because its activity is not necessarily directly controlled by you or I, but is an outcome of the way that the model is, is operated. So now 
uh, we can set a relationship between one of our units in the hidden layer to our nodes in the output layer so that when we activate a node in the hidden layer, it has gradient activation of output layer nodes. But we can also modulate which of the nodes in the input layer are triggering how much activation to that node in the hidden layer so that we might get a cascade of information through the network that is quite dynamic. If we activate this node in the input layer, it'll activate this node in the hidden layer and both of these nodes in the output layer. And the same is true if we activate this node and this node in the input layer. So now we have a much more dynamic representation space where um, different inputs can have the same output. And through the inclusion of this hidden layer, information is effectively restructured. So what might this mean for the way that we can organize information about real world things, object knowledge or category knowledge? Well, to give a simple example, input nodes might be pet breeds. So we might have things like a Siamese, which is a type of cat, a Labrador, a pug, a Shiba Inu, which are all types of dog. And for some of those nodes, they might be activating some kind of an internal representation in the hidden layer so that the outcome of that system might activate features such as has four legs and other properties like sometimes barks as opposed to sometimes swims or sometimes flies. So this is just a, a very simple illustration of the idea that information could be held in a kind of parallel distributed processing system that allows inputs of different kinds to generate internal representations that allow us to access outputs, such as semantic feature information. When we think back to what we know about the organization of the human brain and how our processing units are neurons, we can think about how that corresponds to the simplified model that is implemented in this kind of neural network. So the processing unit, rather than being a neuron, is a node. Uh, we know that human brains have hundreds of billions of connections uh, and those are instantiated by axons that carry the signal from the cell body of the neuron all the way down the long axon to the dendrites where that information is passed through the synapse to the next neuron in the system. Now, those axons and synapses are represented in a neural network by the edges between the nodes Connection strength in a real brain, we know, is down to myelination, which can assist the speed of information transfer from uh, the cell body of one neuron to the dendrites at the synapse, which is the connection to the next neuron, and also the state of the neurotransmitters at the synaptic cleft, which might speed or slow the transfer of information from one neuron to the next. And we can think of these in a neural network sense as weights. So the amount of information that is transferred from one neuron to the next. Flexibility in the human brain is something we refer to as plasticity, the way that a human brain can organize or reorganize itself so that it can use its neurological resources in different ways, depending on its exposure patterns and depending on whether or not we're recovering from some kind of an unexpected disruption to neurological function. In a neural network sense, we can think about flexibility in the system as an outcome of the training regime, the way that we adapt the network by changing those weights, given different information states or different desired outcomes. Uh, in a brain, we know we have what we would normally refer to as true intelligence. Uh, in the neural network system, we can think about uh, what is known as artificial intelligence or a simulation of some of the features of intelligence that we see in humans. Uh, and this is also referred to as deep learning. And it's referred to as deep learning because often the information state of those hidden layers is uh, literally not known even to the, to the developers who created a particular system. So let's look at an example from the literature. This is Rummelhart's model from the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And this is, again, a simulation of the kinds of information that could be stored in a neural network, such as our own human information processing system. 
On the left hand side, you can see a list of things that we might want to query in the network. So if we look from the bottom to the top, we can see some fish, some birds, some flowers, some trees. Uh, and then higher up, we have some concepts like animal and tree and plant and even this superordinate category, living things. Um, at the lower left of the model, you can see some relational elements in the system. Is, are, is, can, and has. And these are connected to a certain um, different subsets on the right hand side of the model, which could be possible outputs if we were to query this system. So what I've illustrated here is the activation of the node Robin in the input layer and some green internal representations are being triggered. So if we trigger activation in both Robin and can, we get information Robin can grow, Robin can move, Robin can fly. Now the internal representation states inside this model are somewhat of a mystery to us, but we can sort of understand how different patterns of connectivity in those weights could produce this kind of outcome. This contrasts with the hierarchical system we looked at when we were first looking at categorization, where uh, information might be stored at different levels in the hierarchy. And one of our reasons for thinking this is if we ask questions like, is a robin a bird? People can answer that question quite quickly. But if we ask, is a robin an animal? Traveling so far up the hierarchy seems to take a longer amount of time for some people. However, this two-step process doesn't seem to hold for words like, for, for queries like, is a gorilla an animal versus is a gorilla a primate, where many people will find it a lot easier to answer the question, is a gorilla an animal, as opposed to is a gorilla a primate. So with this kind of insight, we can try to understand that maybe the speed differences we saw earlier might be due to other processes like word association. So how closely linked in a more flexible semantic network are two concepts, rather than how far away they are in some kind of a logical hierarchical relationship. So when we're training a model, we start the system in a kind of a neutral or default state. Uh, so all of the weights inside that predetermined architecture will start with a random or with an arbitrary value. At the beginning of training, some inputs are generated, and as that input propagates through the system, different activation states will emerge. The next stage of training is to check those outputs and see how they compare to a desired output state. And this error signal can be used to adjust the weights between the input layer and the hidden layer, and between the hidden layer and the output layer to move that system towards the desired output state. Once those weights have been adjusted in one round of training, uh, new inputs will be generated and those outputs checked and the weights adjusted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This process continues with the error signal being used to tune the model to the relationship between input and output data. And this whole process is uh, repeated until the error reaches uh, zero or perhaps just better than it started. Let's take a look at what training looks like in the model that we were just looking at before. So on the left hand side we can see a bunch of different category names and what we can see in the left hand column is after 25 rounds of training the little bars in the outputs are very random looking. There's not much that we can see there that helps us differentiate between a tree, a flower, a bird or a fish. By epoch 20, we're starting to see a few differences between the upper four and the lower four, where the ones that are plants versus the ones that are animals are starting to show subtle differences in the organization of the outputs. By epoch 500, though, we're starting to see something much more subtle. Uh, if we look just at those plants to begin with, we can see that all of the plants have higher bars on the left hand side and uh, a little dip in the middle and then higher bars on the right, followed by a dip again at the end. 
And there's something about that representation that is telling us that these ones are plants. But there are also differences between the individuals which tell us which plant is which. When we look at the birds, we can see a pattern of representation where we have one very tall bar towards the middle and two very tall bars towards the right. But again, we can see subtle differences between the canary and the robin, which might help us to figure out which one is which. Then when we look at the salmon and the sunfish, we see a uh, different pattern again. We have one very tall bar somewhere towards the middle, one very tall bar somewhere towards the right, and one tall one in between. But again, the heights of those bars differ just a little bit, which might be telling us a bit about the difference between the salmon and the sunfish, even though they both belong to the same category of fish. So these internal representations kind of emerge as an outcome of the training process. So why do people like connectionism so much? Well, apart from being an alternative way of conceptualizing the way that information uh, might be held in a human mind, there are a couple of properties that make it quite powerful as a model of human cognition. One is that we see graceful degradation. So if we snip randomly some of those edges between different nodes in the network, the network may start to make some errors, but it won't be catastrophically destroyed in the same way that one of those semantic hierarchies might be. So if we were to cut the link uh, between animal and bird, for example, we might lose access in a hierarchical model to all of the information that we know about living things uh, from the category of birds. Whereas in a computational model, uh, we might lose the power to tell which bird is which, but we might not lose uh, access to those broader information types. The other property that people quite like about con connectionist models is that they can help to explain how learning is quite generalizable, that it works in the same way for many different kinds of learning. So the example that we've looked at for connectionist modeling today has been about uh, object properties and semantic knowledge, but it's possible that the same training mechanism could be used to learn different kinds of knowledge as well. One final feature to finish this off today uh, is the idea that the very processes that we're looking at in a neural network model might be quite similar to the processes that we see in an actual wet human brain. Patients who have suffered traumatic brain injury or uh, some kind of medical episode like a stroke, they might end up with a brain injury to a particular part of their brain, which is used for the representation of particular kinds of semantic information. So here we have a chart representing uh, the performance of two different patients, KC and EW, who were asked uh, questions that interrogated their knowledge of different kinds of objects that they had known from before they had had their brain injury. And what we can see in this case is that both of these patients have a deficit in their semantic representation for the living animals, but they do not have a similar representational deficit for their non-living animals. And this suggests to us that there is a functional localization of some information to certain brain regions that are dissociable in the sense that we can tell one apart from the other by this pattern of deficits. And this in some ways reminds us of how those computational models might develop an ability to represent a particular kind of information in a particular pattern of output nodes. And if those output nodes or the connections to them are disrupted, then the representation of that category would be impaired, at least for some time until recovery is possible. So that's our little supplement on computational models in cognitive psychology and how they can give us a different perspective on the ways that we can store and access information about the world, the objects that we know about and their properties.